Welcome to the Yoga of Ascension. I'm Zachary Adama. Today we have Gerilyn Jindro. Is that, did I say that right? It's a tough one, Gerilyn Jindro. Well, I'm from Kentucky. French. I don't I know actually, that I can do I that. I actually don't say it right. <laughs> it's the sound they make in French that we don't make, but the way to remember it is it rhymes with Marilyn Monroe. Well, okay. There you go. Well, Gerilyn. no, you know, in Kentucky, we also call Louisville Louisville. So Louisville, know, and, we, and, and, Ver, and we have a, a city called uh, Versailles, which is spelled like Versailles. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. being from Kentucky, we have an interesting relationship with the French language. <laughs> <laughs> but um, Gerilyn is an author and licensed psychotherapist whose inquiries into optimal mother-infant bonding and critique of attachment theory provide a powerful insight into how we can form enduring harmonious love bonds, as well as dynamic high-functioning relationships in our professional lives. Gerilyn spent many years under the tutelage of Jean Ledloff, author of The Continuum, Continuum Concept, also known as TCC. Now a torchbearer for Ledloff's world-changing ideas, Gerilyn is intent on creating a renaissance in TCC. First published in 1975 and still popular 46 years later, Ledloff's seminal book about her experience living with, quote, original peoples in deep jungles of South America gave birth to the baby wearing trend and attachment parenting movement, which I'm sure many of us are familiar with, especially if you've been in any crunchy communities where babies are strapped to mommy and daddy. What kind um, of communities did you say? Crunchy communities. Crunchy? Yeah. Like earthy crunchy? Yeah, earthy crunchy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Geraldine also has a new book out called Jungle Gene which is an authorized biography of her mentor uh, and where Geraldine explores many of the other topics that, that we just discussed about like TCC and different things. So that's enough of that as far as a formal introduction. I just wanted to say welcome and thank you for being on. Uh, your work looks really fascinating to me and I was kind of aware of this body of work. You know, I, I don't have children. I, I, cho I chose to opt out of that so far. Me too. Uh, I'm childless by choice. But I've, I really find this really interesting. Um, and I, I've always said, you know, I don't want to have children outside of the village. You know, I, you know, I grew up in the smart. sort of atomized way of living that, that we have in modern Western culture. And I don't want to have kids in that context, you know. And uh, I know that this is a lot of what uh, TCC is about, is, is, is really you know, trying to right some of the errors we've made in Western civilization when it comes to family and child rearing. But if you would just tell us a little bit about what uh, the continuing concept is and, you know, what, how, re how it's relevant uh, for people. Well, you know, you, you've done a brilliant job just creating a context for it, like the relevance to people who want to have children. I often say if I had read this book when I was, you know, young enough and still on the, you know, on the hunt for the right <laughs> firm donor or whatever, you know, the husband, whatever the, the kind of paradigm out there is that I might've had children. Yeah. But I, when I was like really at that age, I thought, you know, I'll just screw them up. I don't know what to do. I, I, I know that the way I was raised isn't going to do it. They're going to, they're going to grow up as nutty as me if I do that. <laughs> so when I read the continuum concept, um, it literally buckled my knees. A friend of mine handed it to me. There's a whole backstory that I won't go into, but I was profoundly moved. I had, mm -hmm. I had finished graduate school. I had done three years of uh, schooling and training and working at Haight-Ashbury Psych Services and in San Francisco at the Women's Alcoholism Center where they had a parenting manual. All of those things uh, you know, I was just like scratching my head going, okay, now I can name all the different ways that human beings get messed up. That's not why I went to school. I want to see where the healthy human beings are and how they got that way. And I said something to a friend one day and she was like, here, read this book. And she handed me Jean's book and it blew my mind. So, so my book is actually her biography. Right. I knew her, was dear friends with her for many years. She was my mentor and then my friend and my nemesis in some ways. 
Um, but this is her biography. On her deathbed, she asked me to write it. And I was the obvious person to do it because I knew her quite well. And I've been a professional writer for, well, at that point, only 10 years. This was 10 years ago. She died in 2011. So basically, the continuum had a nutshell. It's always an interesting challenge. And I, I try not to give an elevator speech because it is, it is an emergent phenomenon. Really, the continuum is the the, the pulse of the universe, I'll speak in yogic terms because this is the Yoga of Ascension podcast, so I can say it in ways that I wouldn't necessarily to a like more mainstream audience. But you know, we know from yogic teachings that the universe is made is Leela, you know, mm. it's made of this essential stuff. I read uh, something in your your description about love is love, you know, like what we are is love, peace is your birthright. You know, yeah. I have three of those two that are very similar, so we'll get there. But um, so the continuum is the biological evolutionary continuum of the innate expectations that we're born with. So we were shaped by this force we call evolution. So the universe is always expanding. What we are grew along these specific lines that were more or less governed by the evolutionary process itself. So there's an emergent phenomenon called a human being that derives from 7 million years mm -hmm. of hominid evolution. And basically the whole thing is like, you can't argue with evolution. You can try. <laughs> I think it was, it's Katie, uh, uh, Byron Katie. She says, she says uh, you can argue with reality but you're gonna lose. You're gonna you're gonna lose, but only a hundred percent of the time. And the same is true of evolution. You can argue with evolution if you want, but you're gonna lose a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. And the most stark. So that's the continuum concept. The way it gets translated into the baby wearing trend, and this became a child rearing classic. Her book became a child rearing classic. Uh, she wasn't writing a child rearing classic. She wasn't a mom. She didn't want kids. Well, she didn't not want kids, but that wasn't what she wrote the book about. She wrote the book about her experience of noticing that these people knew something about human nature we didn't. Mm -hmm. But they had an understanding of what we truly are and what we can be. This is completely missing in Western mm -hmm. society. So she had a very, very unique perspective. Yeah. And I actually, uh, in January of 2020, before the world went crazy, uh, went down to Peru um, and uh, sat in with ayahuasca for a uh -huh. couple of weeks. And wow. we, got to, we got to visit uh, some of the villages, the indigenous villages there. And it was, um, it was just amazing. You know, you had just seen gangs of, of children running around playing, smiling, just so free and happy. Um, and, 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 you know, they were materially, quote, you know, poor by Western modern standards, but the joy, the contentment, and the connection that was just everywhere was palpable. And, you know, I saw so many happy faces there amidst what would be considered material poverty. Yes. Yeah. And then as soon as I got back into the States, I saw all this tightness, all this uh, restlessness, this busyness, this unhappiness, this disconnectedness. And I listened to a few interviews that you've done now. And, and apparently one thing that Jean talked about was the armoring of the Westerner, yeah. how we go through life so emotionally armored. So, you know, not wanting to make eye contact with one another, not wanting to connect with one another. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, because I think that's a really fascinating. It is. I, you know, what I actually want to do is um, I'm I'm distracted because I'm pulling up the uh, I'm pulling up the manuscript. I did a book release party yesterday and I had the I had the horrible I, when I've gone to book readings and I see the author like going through the pages. I'm like, what? Like, <laughs> why do you do that? I was doing that yesterday because I had them all tagged, but they got ripped off. But the beautiful thing is when I have the manuscript up here, I can just do it. So um, yes, she, she had a very similar experience mm -hmm. to what you had. Like she mm -hmm. saw that these people who whose lives were so simple, but mm -hmm. joy was their natural state. Yeah. So they didn't generosity. Have... Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. There are so many stories in here. I just want to um, see if I can find this one. 
well, it's exactly what you're saying, the New Yorkers. Um, well, I'm just going to read you this little bit because it's what I landed on. It's like, open the book and read what's there. OK, so this is one of the ways that we can see how starkly different their society, their contextual reality, mm -hmm. their expectations of themselves are other or other are so profoundly different than ours. And it's part of why I like to sh share these stories is because they kind of shape people a little bit. Mm -hmm. Like your experience in South America, seeing those children would startle something in you. like whoa, yeah. that, that's a homo sapien. I'm a homo sapien. How come they're, that was Jean's question. She was yeah. like, how come they're having such a very good time with the very human nature that is giving us such a hard time? Yeah. Like, what is it about? And it's really the way they live and the way, this is what they're continued. They are what she would call um, continuum correct. They, the, the information they got is correct for optimal development. Now we get information too, but it's obviously not for optimal development. Thus all the neurotic, you know, the different forms of thus the DSM, you know, we've got all, all these form of neurosis. So I'm gonna just read this a little bit. Um, one example of the Aquana way piqued her interest early on. These tribal people never displayed even a smidgen of boredom. Imagine that. Unquestioned by them. They have iPhones. They, they were, yeah, well. Well, okay. <laughs> you make a good point. No, they did not have iPhones. But how many people do you know are on their iPhone because they're bored? Yeah. You know, we, we get on our iPhones for any number of reasons. Sometimes it's just because we're so uncomfortable in our skin that it gives us something to do. I believe of... they call it uh, per 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 perpetual partial inattention. I think is the oh, I like right. that. I'm yeah. writing that now. Yeah, Her that was coined back in the mining. Yeah, God, that's beautiful. Yeah, it was a, a tech Don't writer. Don't get me wrote started. It. Don't yeah. get me started. We could have a whole conversation about that. Right? It was it's this idea that 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 our technology, our modern technology, uh, keeps us in a state of, of perpetual partial inattention. That we're always seeking to be a, a live node on the network to send and receive information. And we're never fully present for anything, including our I own lives. That. Perpetual so. partial inattention. Yeah, yeah. That's a good one. Okay, well, let's go back. I'm to sorry that. to interrupt you. It's fine. I like those kind of interruptions. Interrupt me anytime with a good new phrase that I can run off with. Um, anyway, uh, unquestioned by them and yet notable to Jean, she reflected on this, comparing it to the tendency of civilized culture to rob people of well being by assigning them repetitive tasks, thus depriving them of a variety of stimuli. I mean, think about your phone, that's a repetitive task as if there was one, you know? So there's, there's, a, there's a certain kind of stimuli, but it's the variety of stimuli that our organism evolved to expect. So that's a key, we'll come back to that. The expectations is a key to her theory, um, but I diverge. Uh, so, for example, factory workers must ignore the discomfort of boredom and quash their urge to alter their focus if they want to keep their job. In contrast, the Yaquana respect the limits of their attention and answer the signal to do something else long before boredom disturbs their state of well-being. Jobs that we would consider humdrum, such as making a manioc grater by hammering rows of sharp metal bits onto a board, are turned into an art project. Instead of a monotonous pattern of row after horizontal row, the women begin with a diamond pattern, then work inward, filling in the diamond until the pattern disappears. Likewise, a long day of roof building, which involves lashing palm leaves to a framework with a woody vine called the liana, is transformed from a dull, tedious task into a party. The men inch along a makeshift scat folding Carrying piles of leaves for hours, they lashed the cumbersome palm leaves to the framework one by one without getting the least bit bored. Often they invite men from the neighboring village to help and serve a special drink made of fermented manioc that keeps everyone a wee bit tipsy. So, you know, what is the thing, the thing that you say in your, uh, there, is it joy? You say joy is... Joy, uh, the, uh, joy is your true nature. I don't remember. Your, yes, your true nature. I joy think is your true nature, nature. I think. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, that's what I, that's one of my three is joy yeah. is our natural state. Yeah. yeah. But we live in a society that doesn't like instill that in us as the baseline mm -hmm. 
And therefore we're always looking for satisfaction somewhere. Mm. Yeah. But at the same time, I feel like that is so often what brings people to yoga is mm. that it did me, it, that mm. fundamental dissatisfaction. And if you're not getting it from your phone and all the other external stimuli at some point, you have to look somewhere else for it. Yeah. And fortunately, we have these eternal, you, you know, we have mm. these wisdom traditions that bring us there. Yeah, and we've exiled play from our daily lives, except we put it on the periphery. You know, yes. we work yes. hard and we play, or we or we play hard. We don't do both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. and so play ends up getting manifesting in in some sort of pathological and neurotic ways, binge drinking, drug, you know, recreational drug abuse, and just different things. Um, but yeah, we we exiled play. That's a good phrase life. too. You're good with words. We exile play. <laughs> yeah, we, we excised do. it from our work lives. So yeah. serious people don't play or, you know, they don't play or, you know, we're down, it's down to business. You know, we got to get serious right. now. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think so much of that is to do with, well, we do shit we don't want to do all mm -hmm. day long. Mm -hmm. And if we, paid too much attention to our authentic desire we wouldn't want to do it <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> and that kind of brings me to thinking about the where we're at right now post-covid with so many people quitting their jobs and um, they just don't want to do it anymore you it's know. interesting how that that was a pattern interrupt in many ways yeah and yeah. people who got to work from home yeah and then businesses who realized wow they're more productive working from home yeah you know, San Francisco, like there's a lot of empty apartments. The rents are going down. That's unheard of because so many people discovered work from home. Right. Where and you then, can have incorporate a little play into your day. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or do the laundry while you're on a Zoom call and you don't actually need to be on video. You know, right. like I'm right. done, like I'm folding my laundry while I'm on the call to catch what I need to catch. But yeah. it's like, and that's not so much multitasking as just allowing a more natural flow mm -hmm. and the playfulness into life, into the everyday life. Yeah. Well, I know for the last year, year and a half, you know, I'm a, my, a lawyer by profession and yeah. uh, I've been doing zoom court for the last year and a half. And we're starting finally going back to, to in-person court and uh, people were starting to go back to the office and things like that. And I had in-person court the first time a few weeks ago. And, you know, I had to get it put on my suit and tie, which is so uncomfortable. <laughs> and um, I had to go to the courthouse, be there at a certain time, find parking, go through a metal detector where you take off, you know, your belt and different things. And they won you. And finally, I get to the courtroom and I sit down and and I just I, I just energetically very stressed from it and yeah. and I was like and I've recognized I've looked at some of the videos I started doing pre-COVID and some of the post and you know now current videos and there's just this layer of armoring that was present in the older videos that this break from you know that COVID has blessed me with of of being a little being at home more you know being not being around so many different people not going to stressful situations like court all the time uh, has allowed me to soften yeah. in, 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 in a, a really profound way. And now that I go back into the world and go back, try going back to some of those old routines and like sitting in a desk for eight to 10 hours a day, um, it's, I'm noticing how stressful the status quo was, yeah. how unsustainable it was, mm -hmm. how, it disconnected me from my humanity and in, in important ways just to survive it. Yes. And, and that's sort of modern culture and civilization in a nutshell is you're burning the candle at both ends all the time and you're overstimulated all the time. And you just don't get the luxury of, of being soft because yeah. you're just trying to survive. Yeah. And you, I, that's something else I noticed when I was in Peru with the indigenous peoples, that quality of relaxation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that quality of ease, of abundance. Yeah. And, you know, they weren't armored. 
you know, I, you could look into their, their eyes, you know, whether there's an old woman or a child that they were guileless. Yeah. And it was open and just honest and, and, and present in, in, in ways that I, I don't see when I come back to the States or, yeah. or you know, and uh, that, that may have been a little bit of a tangent, but it also is uh, something else that I think that, that Jean talked about. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That was the experience that she had. The stark contrast yeah. compelled her to look at why and what it is. It, what is it about our society? Yeah. But and you know the what the book became, what her book became so known for really was addressing that alienation, that place where we separate from our true nature, from our joy, from as a result of Western obstetrics and gynecology mm -hmm. and now things have changed a lot since right. she was an infant and since I was an infant your generation had the benefit largely most of y'all I'm assuming you're at least 20 years younger than me yeah, I'm 35 oh my goodness you're more than 20 years younger than me oh I just dated myself anyway um I, I wanted to know by the way what kind of law are you practicing? Are you a litigator? You're, a commercial you're, litigator. You're a commercial litigator. That's intense. Yeah, it can be. It can be. I deal with some intense uh -huh. personalities. Yeah, I bet. Some anyway, really I, big egos and really unhappy people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, and the root of this unhappiness does come back to this not ever really knowing what our natural state is. Yeah. And when an infant is not held next to its mother's body, it, it so so there's here's the thing that's really I think why the continuum concept was so popular and why it still is all these years later. It still has a I think last time I checked the Amazon sales ranking was number 20,000 or something, mm -hmm. which is unheard of for a book that's mm -hmm. been around for 45 years right. and has no promotion whatsoever but word of mouth right but people recognized what she was saying was true when when mothers were told your infant's body expects to be held mm -hmm. like this is what evolution prepared it to do it was queen victoria that invented the pram like mm -hmm. you know our ancestors didn't you, you know there were millions of years of hominid evolution where there wasn't even a wheel much less you know a carriage so the whole giving women permission to hold the baby was really really important and i hear a lot of the objections i had someone recently a medical doctor said something he said well that's very harsh baby wearing mm -hmm. and i mm -hmm. thought well because we are conditioned to believe that child care is a separate thing it's a thing separate from life mm -hmm. whereas the indigenous people it's just part of life it's part mm -hmm. of the flow now how do you translate in that in that into modern life there are lots of groups because it isn't a simple thing we can't like go back into the rainforest and we can't necessarily suddenly behave in the ways that indigenous peoples do because we have all these pressures and expectations and the cell phones and you know, the refrigerator that needs to be defrosted or whatever, you know, all the complications of modern life, how to navigate those is a, is a whole different conversation. But to know that there's something you can trust called your maternal instinct, yeah. like you can actually listen to your instinctive response to that baby crying, which is to pick it up. Yeah. A lot of times the baby's crying because it needs contact. That's the signal it's giving. But this let him cry it out thing, yeah. which I hear is in vogue again, which is <laughs> shocking to me. Like, when did that come back into it? Like, really? Let them cry it out? Yeah. Which leads to adults who don't feel supported. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or the air they breathe, they don't trust the air they breathe. Yeah, they don't. You know, like there's a way that distrust is the foundation. Mm -hmm. We live in a hostile universe. It's not going to take exactly, care of us. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Like, I like to talk about. Um, I like to compare. Just if you think about the fact that we're mammals, okay. Yeah. All other mammals, like if you've ever watched a horse or a cow give birth, the colt 
the little, the, you know, they get up on all four legs in no time at all. Like they come out, they're kind of wet and floppy. And next thing you know, they're up on all fours. Mm -hmm. So they're fairly independent from birth. Homo sapiens, when, when we went upright, the pelvis narrows. Mm -hmm. So the baby has to be delivered very prematurely because it's now got this big head. You know, we've got this neocortex going on because part of the, when we went upright, the way the eyes change, the optic nerve changes and the prefrontal cortex develops. So here you've got this big headed thing trying to squeeze out of this narrow pelvis and it comes out and we're not marsupials. We don't have a pouch, but we do have arms and we have opposable thumbs and, we've, and tool making is our strength as a species. It's part of how we survive. So we tie a sling around. So the baby goes from being inside mommy's body to on mommy's body and stays there for six to nine months. In Bali, it's Bali's a continuum intact culture, and they have a ceremony at six months mm. when the baby's feet hit the earth for the first time. It's beautiful. Because they understand, they understand the biological evolutionary reality of that dependency. And the interesting thing is that. When people's dependency needs, very authentic, genuine dependency needs are met, they can naturally become independent yeah. as a natural developmental stage. But we rob ourselves of that. Yeah. And they feel expect- support. You have to really feel supported, I think, psychologically, in order to be able to make that transition to true independence. Absolutely. You know, I think if you're, like mo- many of us have, we were, we were born into this situation where, you know, like in the United States, we don't have paid parental leave. So mothers have to go back to work almost immediately. Um, yes. And so children, they're with relatives, or maybe they're in some sort of daycare or something. Uh, but they're, they're taken from their mother within weeks of being born often. Mm-hmm. And so we have generations now uh, of people who have been taken from their mothers weeks, you know, if not sooner from being born. And yeah. so they're going to go through life with this fundamental sense that I'm not supported, <laughs> that that I live in a hostile universe, that I got to take care of myself, that nobody else yeah. is going to. And yeah. and so we, we that puts us automatically into a, an armored sort of defensive posture, I think. Um, that just continues through life. And when you start out that way and you try to be, you know, independent, quote, independent, form some sort of independence, you, I think, end up doing it with a certain amount of ferocity that's trying to hide the fear that I'm not supported. (laughs) This, this universe is hostile and out to get me. And, um, and so I think it just, it starts life off on this note of fear and lack of trust. And um, yeah, it, it's just, it's, it's incredibly sad. I have friends that they've had children in recent years and, you know, they're back to work within, within weeks or months um, and spend, get, have little, very little time to spend with the baby. And, and there's just something in me. I understand the economic necessity of it. I don't judge them by any means. I mean, this is a societal problem that we have that's a, that represents our perverse values. But, you know, it's just something within me just just sort of winces at the thought of, of the baby being taken from the mother so soon. Well, it's very true. You're, you're identifying like the root cause of our societal troubles, you mm-hmm. know, in a sense, there's this alienation from self. Uh, I'm careful not to use, yes, there's this notion of a hostile universe, but it's not that extreme for some people. Mm-hmm. It's, there's a gradient depending on how much, how much of the, we'll call them attachment needs. I really don't like that word, yeah. but we all, it's a shared, it's the vocabulary. So we'll, mm-hmm. we'll use it. So depending on how much of their attachment needs get met, they may feel like the university, I mean, there is the language of secure attachment, insecure mm-hmm. attachment, you know, all of that, but it's all a matter of degrees. Yeah. And so they had additional traumas. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And the, the, um, 
the compensatory mechanism, the way the organism deals with that distrust is, is a totally unique, it's as unique as a fingerprint. That, that's the crime behind the DSM is we give, we assign it a name and then we think we have a treatment modality. Now, not to, not to undermine treatment any more than you wanna undermine the law, but there is, there is something so very personal about how we deal with this stress of not getting our biological evolutionary, our evolutionary expectations met. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a dance because, and again, I, I bring this back to yoga because yoga was my healing path yeah. for quite a long time. It, I, I'm more into Tai Chi now and just meditation because at my age, everything doesn't stretch the way I used to. <laughs> I always say I used to do show off yoga. That was my method, show off because I have like hypermobile joints and I could mm -hmm. do like crazy stuff that most human bodies don't do. And now I'm paying the price for it. It's called <laughs> ligaments problems. But anyway, um, it's, it, there, I think it's important to hold a frame of reference from where we are now that it's all perfect. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about Gabor Mate's work that he just did the, um, the on trauma, what was it called? Something like the beauty of trauma or something there. Yeah. I can't remember, it, but very beautiful that that is now being talked about so openly. Trauma is really coming out of the closet. Yeah. And I think that that uh, documentary, I think that they, it was the science and non duality, mm -hmm. science, science and non duality people did yeah. really like trauma has suddenly gone from like, Nobody wants to talk about it too. It's on everybody's mind, not everybody, let's yeah. face it. But I think there were like 40,000 people in yeah. the Facebook group in a matter of a week. When does that happen? Yeah, I, it's, you know, the traditional psychology, Western psychology, we, it's a pathology model, you know. You, yes, exactly. You, you yeah. have the, you look up your symptoms and, and here's your treatment, but, you know, you still want to carry that identity around. And like most yeah. of Western medicine, we're not really talking about a cure. We're talking about coping with the symptoms. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we just assume that, that the pathology itself is immutable, you know, and that we're just going to try to manage the symptoms. Um, you know, I, you know, I do also energy healing. That's something that, that I do as, as part of my offerings uh, with people. And, you know, I go through, through the energy body, the chakras and different things. And, and you, can, you can sense and see where these bioenergetic blockages build up in the body that are basically just stuck memories. I mean, ultimately yeah. that's what it is. It's a stuck memory in the body. And if you bring enough breath, awareness and light to it, you can dissolve it. Uh, you know, I, I talk to people, I say, you know, by the time we're done doing this healing work, you're not gonna really remember the trauma. Or it's it's going to go from being like a a a, a three D printed full color HD image to a black and white image that doesn't hold any emotional charge, and and that mm -hmm. that's, that's when you know metaphor. that you've really gotten healed is it's lost its emotional charge. There's no push. There's no pull. Yeah. It just is. And mm -hmm. some really traumatic. I've worked through some really traumatic things with people. Uh, they've gone through to psychotherapy they've done all this that they've talked and talked and talked about it they've looked at it from the freudian perspective and all the perspective and it still keeps bubbling up into their mind as a thing that they continually think about that that shapes their behavior and who they are in the world yeah. but then when we get down into the energy body and start dissolving the bioenergetic mem you know, meme that is that is stuck there and on replay all of a sudden the mind's getting calmer all of a sudden they're not thinking about it anymore all of a sudden it's not shaping their decisions and it's not shaping their reality and it's it's a different model it's it's a different model of healing than 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 what we traditionally have yeah yeah it's very um it's a beautiful thing to watch all this when when i was in graduate school the now they call it the positive psychology mm -hmm. movement or you know that now there's like a psycho positive psychology courses at you at berkeley um but what were you what you were saying that's just so beautiful about this the way that it can dissolve i love mm -hmm. the way you articulated it 
I always say that you go from, whether you call it a belief or a trauma, you go from it having you to you having it. Yeah. So like it has me until the implicit memory, the implicit experience becomes explicit and you see it. And whether that happens through energy work, I'm with you. I think talk therapy is very limited, mm -hmm. but more and more talk therapists are trained in the energetics, yeah. you know, and to be able to read the body. So I would, I always suggest to people when they, um, when they're thinking about doing therapy to really look for somebody who has a diverse Right. you know, portfolio, basically, <laughs> because you, you have to be able to work at multiple levels. Talk right. therapy is very, very limited. Yeah. That's part of why most people I don't want to talk about the hard stuff. <laughs> they don't. Yeah. There's too much and trauma around time, it. Yeah. There's a lot of trauma around it. And so there's a, there's a, I'll, I'll just mention this. There's a subplot in the book about this thing called the blind spot. Mm -hmm. I, uh, th that's a name I gave it. And Jean and I talked about it quite a lot because there is a way that sometimes even energy healing, well, I think very advanced practitioners can dissolve. I like the word dissolve. I did some work with uh, Bruce Francis, Bruce Kumar Francis, who's a, a Taoist energy master, really. And um, I was his editor on a book called um, Taoist Sex Meditation. <laughs> and he was talking about dissolving. He kept talking about dissolving, 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 because it's not the fire method of Taoism. It's the water method. It's an mm -hmm. ancient tradition that got lost. And um, he received the lineage from an ancient Taoist sage. There's, I mean, it's, a, it's a quite a story. It was a little unbelievable. But once I experienced his energy work, I was like, oh, my goodness, the big kahuna here. But um, I remember when he kept saying dissolving and I was like, what do you mean dissolving? Like I could not wrap my head around what that meant dissolving. So I find it very interesting that you use that term. I think yeah. that these things, uh, uh, like you used the word meme. I think these things are hidden until they're not. And then they mm -hmm. spread through culture. And this is what gives me a tremendous amount of hope when we're looking down the abyss of extinction, mm -hmm. you know, extreme weather events, all the stuff that's going on. It's like, wow, maybe this really is the end. Yeah. But at the same time, there's this, there's this other thing going on. There's this emergent phenomenon that is the healing, the healing forces, the healing powers that are at play and the ways that we're understanding and transforming our realities through these practices. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I, I envy you going to Peru. What was that like? My oh, God, I want to interview yeah. you about your Peru experience. <laughs> well, did you wander it, down there on your own, or I was? I went by myself. Um, I felt oh. called to go, um, and uh, you know, I, I'd never my my path has been uh, Kriya Yoga, you know, and uh -huh. it's um, it's that's Yogananda, right? Yogananda, yeah, yeah. yeah that's been my path for almost ten years now. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I'd never done any plant medicines or psychedelics or anything like that. I, I, I tend to, I tend towards more of the renunciate path in my personality and different things, you know, vegetarian, don't drink alcohol, don't do caffeine, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and, uh, but, you know, I have a friend who had been down there and benefited greatly from it. And, uh, he, he's been on sort of a plant medicine journey and, mm -hmm. uh, I did golden cat mushrooms with him one weekend and during, and we were by a, a creek and in hammocks and it was just amazing and blissful. And I communed with Jesus and Mary. And then finally this golden goddess came in and it was this golden earth mother goddess. And she said, go to Peru and sit with wow. mother ayahuasca. And uh, so I, a few days that next week, I booked my, or I applied to, to go down to Peru and, and sit with Mother Ayahuasca. And by January, I was there uh, and it was fantastic. And I was really trying to discern spiritual vocation at the time because, mm -hmm. you know, I, I felt called to, towards some sort of spiritual vocation and service for a long time but I didn't really know how it was going to manifest. Uh -huh. And um, I was weighing different options. And, and so I, I went down to Peru to see if I could get some guidance. 
And for all four ceremonies, it was me and Kali Ma, uh, and I was baby Ganesha in her arms. And it was just, I was baby Ganesha in Divine Mother's arms. And uh, there, there's more to that. We toured the entire universe and went beyond time and space, and it was indescribable. But it was really an initiatory experience. Um, yeah. And, you know, Kriya Yoga had been there all along. Uh, and I had never really thought about it as being a, the, my mode or means of, of service. Um, but I got clarity during that ceremony and, and in the subsequent uh, weeks and months and years that that was my main service. And, mm -hmm. um, and so that's sort of how all that came about. And that's how I'm, I'm where I'm at now. And I felt moved uh, in or in December of 2019 to start a YouTube channel, which is mm -hmm. a hell of a lot cheaper than seminary. So <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a beautiful story. Yeah. Wow. Well, tell me how I you met a, Jean. Oh, okay. I just want to say one thing before we leave that one. You were mm. talking about being in the arms of, was it Kali Ma? Or? Kali Ma, Kali, yeah. Kali Ma. I had an experience. Um, so Yogananda, well, there's a whole conversation about Yogananda and the impact his book had on me when I read Autobiography of a Yogi. Mm. Um, but I had a similar experience after receiving darshan from Shivalis Ananda mm -hmm. at the City Yoga Ashram in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. And I was out hiking up on Mount Tam and I had a similar experience of being, although I was born of her body, mm -hmm. I was actually given birth to on an orgasm by Shivalis Ananda. <laughs> <laughs> and I wasn't on ayahuasca. I probably had a little ganja that day, but there was, <laughs> so there is something about those encounters with these archetypal right. energies. You know, they're like, there is something, I don't know. I choose to believe that they're real. Yeah. That's well, you choice. can think of them as Jungian archetypes, or you can think of them as, 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 as true, you know, independently existing entities. It doesn't really matter. I don't think the way, as far as I, the way I understand consciousness, it doesn't matter. They're the same thing. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Belief just shapes what's already there. Yeah, it does. So. Yeah, it, that's how our mind no, ends up perceiving story. it. That's the the clothing. Exactly. So. Well, the the so. mind needs to make sense of like yeah. what can't what actually makes no sense. But we yeah. need we need to do some kind of reality making to yeah. tolerate the next ten minutes. You know, <laughs> something concrete. So yeah, I have to tell you, I just love your voice. Oh, thank you. Uh, you have a son. remarkable voice and <laughs> above and beyond the accent, there's something so resonant in your voice. It's really quite remarkable. I can understand why people are drawn to do healing work with you. Oh, thank you. Yeah, uh, you have a they, they say that that the practice of pranayama is good for the voice, you know, as you mm -hmm. as you mm -hmm. cultivate that. And my voice has changed over the years. It's gotten deeper and more resonant. And it's been primarily because of the, the Kriya practice. Uh -huh. um, and it, at least that's my theory. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been to, um, I've been to the one in Encinitas. Uh, do you, had you come out to California ever? I haven't, no. Oh, you have to come and go to, um, oh God, the name of it escapes me. It's at the end of Sunset Boulevard on Highway 1. I, uh, oh, it'll come to me in a moment. Lake Shrine. Lake Shrine. I've been wanting to go Lake there. Shrine. I've seen some of the. Oh, you, you, have to you have to come. You have to come. It's absolutely gorgeous. There's yeah. like his energy like pervades the space. It's That's what I've heard. Stunning, beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, he, he, he built some beautiful sacred spaces. Um, that, yeah. That's something yeah. that's sort of a passion of mine is I think mm -hmm. it's something we're called to do. And that's part of the collective healing is 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 reclaiming the sacred and yeah. and learning how to create sacred spaces again yeah. um and because when you build a place like that continue and have people there that spiritually empower it through their own practice i mean you really you create this vortex of uh it is a, a vortex or you you, know, you can if you want to think of it in terms of morphogenic field it it creates yeah. this new residence in the collective that yeah. that creates opportunities for for healing and and growth and evolution and and delight the, the spiritual fire within people who it may not yet be lit. Yeah. 
You're just totally speaking my language. Yeah. I drive to LA where I live in Ventura is about an hour north of LA. Mm -hmm. And I, I always leave early enough to spend a little time at Lake Shrine, even if it's oh. just to walk the periphery. There's some, some of Gandhi's ashes there. It's oh. absolutely, I want to share with you something. I know you wanted to know how I met Jean, but I'm actually more interested in Yogananda at this moment in time. Um, well, if that's what's alive, that's what we want to talk about. Yeah, so uh, there's a couple things I want to share with you. One is that, um, and this does relate to how I met Jean. I had a near-death experience in 1987. I broke my neck in very, very heavy surf mm -hmm. and was pulled out of the water completely paralyzed. And at the time, this was pre-yoga. I had taken a yoga class in college, but this was, at the time I was studying martial arts. I was training five days a week and bartending at night in San Francisco down on Fisherman's Wharf. And um, I'll fast forward through it because it's a long story that I've written about extensively in a novel called Autobiography of a Yogini. And, and I own the URL. I mean, that is a story in its own, but there was an, at the, when all was said and done and I was, I was not drowning and I was not dead and I was not the entire universe, which you've had some experience of that. I got there through a near death experience, not ayahuasca, but, um, there was a moment where I was paralyzed on the beach and when I realized I was paralyzed, okay, so there's the impact of a wave that crushes your cervical spine. That's an intense impact, but the mm -hmm. impact of realizing I was paralyzed, 10X. Yeah. Like I'd much rather be dead than live frozen from the neck down. I go to martial arts every day. I bartend for a living. What am I going to do in a wheelchair? So the, the, the psychological impact of realizing I was paralyzed, what like seared everything. Mm -hmm. Now you might remember the scene in the matrix where Neo goes into the construct with Morpheus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I don't know if your generation is familiar with the matrix, but he goes into the construct and it's all white. I was there in the construct. Morpheus wasn't there. But there were three movie screens in front of me. Mm -hmm. In the first one was my funeral. And it was kind of fading and going off into the distance. In the middle one, there was me. I had this very short, dikey haircut at the time. I was a martial arts, you know, I was, wore sweatpants all the time. <laughs> and I was probably 20 pounds heavier. And I, so in the middle is me in a wheelchair with a red plaid blanket over my legs. That was like the most real potential in that mm -hmm. moment. And then the third screen was this woman with long blonde hair and curvy body spinning and dancing on stage. So needless to say, I chose door number three <laughs> and subsequently did do a lot of roomy poetry, spinning mm -hmm. and dancing on stage. But the way, the, the way this tracks back to Autobiography of a Yogini and Yogananda is when I was reading his, when I was reading his autobiography, and I came, it was a footnote that gave me an awakening experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually released the, I, I'm doing little videos of the footnotes from Jungle Gene because some of them are so good. And I, I'm just actually connecting these dots right now. I never really realized that that's when I fell in love with footnotes mm -hmm. was a footnote in Autobiography of Yogi that gave me like a, you know, one of those epiphanies that blows mm -hmm. your mind open. And it's where he describes the gunas. Mm -hmm creation, destruction, and preservation. Yeah. And all of a sudden I realized that was that what that moment was. It was like me being given a transmission. Talk about create your reality. It's like in any, and then I, for a long time, I, I related to my reality, like in any given moment, is that kind of a choice moment? Are you going right. to choose destruction, death? Are you going to sustain the reality of here and now you're paralyzed? That's like the, creation destruction and preservation so the preservation would have been to be in a wheelchair and the creation was to create something completely out of nothing and and that that's a kind of like pivotal capacity that we all have is like mm -hmm. to live in that choice point I actually found movements there was a point at which I was like I have to find a movement to express each one of these what's the movement for destruction what's the movement for creation what's the movement and I discovered them mm -hmm. so destruction is a spiral preservation is a pulse mm -hmm. it's like the beat 
and creation is a wave. Yeah. So, you I know, I've done that. ecstatic. Uh, yeah, I've been doing ecstatic dance. Um, we didn't call it ecstatic dance. We called it barefoot dance in my day. Now it's a huge <laughs> movement, but uh, I was an early adopter. Some of me and my friends, we like pioneered that movement, but I would be on the dance floor doing this creation destructive preservation <laughs> thing. And people would be like, what are you doing? Ah, you know, I'm in the vortex. I'm the yogi. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I love that though. That's that's wonderful. I did, you know, and though those gunas are further um embodied in in the the Hindu trinity. You Brahman, Shiva. Vishnu, Shiva. I always get it mixed up. What is Brahman's the sustainer, right? Brahman is the uh the creator and okay. Shiva is the destroyer. Is the destroyer. Vishnu is the preserver. And Vishnu is the sustainer. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's yeah. it's just such a beautiful thing, and I'll tell you this. I'll tell you the story of Yogini. Um, I have fictionalized it. I started writing it after the near death experience because mm -hmm. I've always been a writer. Even you know all these divergent things. Writing has been the one thing that has always been front and center. So I started writing about it, and I was writing it as a memoir. And then after a while, it kind of took off in some interesting directions, and so I had to make it fiction. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my publishing friends, I said something to him about, I said, oh, it's kind of like autobiography of a yogini. And he goes, now that's a title. Because it at the time it was called Black Belt White Heart or something. <laughs> and then at one point it was, uh, I love Tom Robbins. So there, one time it had a very Tom Robbins title. It was something like uh, uh, two deities and a triple crown cola in my rear view mirror. Like what? But, you know, that's how Tom Robbins titles mm -hmm. are sometimes. Right. So, so um that's the publisher said that's a great title and i'm like yeah well that's blasphemous you can't do that and then i said it to somebody else and they went that's a really good title and i said you you can't do that i'm sorry i can't you know it was still memoir then right and then right. my lover at the time he said jeej if it hasn't been done it's yours to do and i said we'll let go daddy decide i went on go daddy i put an autobiography of a yogini.com when it came up available it was like <laughs> I had this like moment of total spinal. I mean, it was really quite something. Yeah. So that I registered it. I've had it for 12 years. I don't know, maybe more than that. But I'm actually going to start releasing that book a chapter at a time. <laughs> well, maybe it wasn't fiction. Maybe it was just other timelines. I like your interpretation. Yeah. I like you're being in the white much. room. <laughs> yes. I guess, yeah. yeah. I mean, I do think that we all live in multiple dimensions. You know, it's hard to know. Yeah. Really. Yeah. And we, we have these little limited perspectives uh, that we have with our five senses in order to try to narrow everything down, to slow things down, to, to play with being finite. And because yeah. otherwise things just move too quickly and are too vast to really change consciousness and being in any significant way. Uh, so yeah, it, it's fairly, I just had a session with somebody earlier today and we were talking about this, how, you know, we were infinite beings, we're, we're infinite spirits and we came into human bodies to experience finiteness for the play of it, for the fun of it. And we forget that we get into these human bodies with our limited perspectives and we take it so seriously. We got to accomplish this. We got to accomplish that. And we, we have to have, be esteemed, you know, we, we want to get the toys and the whatever. We want to be dragons on our gold pile. But we came into these bodies to play. We came into yeah. these bodies for the fun of it. And we're so disassociated from our bodies, I think, so often. And maybe that has to do with the, the being disassociated from our mothers, you know, when we came out and were born into the world. It, maybe it is. Yeah. That's the root of it. Yeah. Because I, I, I know many indigenous people that I saw were so much more comfortable in their body. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're comfortable yeah. in their body, comfortable in their sexuality. Um, yeah. and, and it was just, you know, a, a different thing. And, uh, but yeah, I know that you, know, you, it's, I don't mean to talk down Westerners. I am, I have, I'm a Westerner, I have a Western body, but living in the mind rather than the body seems to be a recurring theme in our culture. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And living in the mind and not the body allows us to really get disconnected 
from reality in, in, in just an incredible way. So, so much so that the story of money can be more valuable than the reality of our biosphere. Absolutely. And it's just a story, but we're so stuck in our head and so disassociated from our body that the story is stronger than the physical reality. Yeah. And uh, it's just such an amazing and sad thing. But that's why I always talk about embodied spirituality. Because, and you know, with Kriya Yoga in particular, you know, you're, you're, you're going through the body. You go through every chakra. And if, if, if the Kundalini energy can't flow smoothly through all the chakras, you're not doing it right. Or you, you know, you got to keep doing your Kriyas. <laughs> we have to be able to operate effectively at every plane of reality. And, um, and as you get more pure and become a hollow reed, so to speak, where you're just God in movement, God doing, spirit moving. You don't take the stories too seriously. Life becomes the dance of creation, destruction, and preservation. And you can laugh through all of it. You can, you can laugh when you're in destruction mode. You can laugh when you're in preservation mode and creation mode. And it, it doesn't matter. It's all play. It's all Lila. You gotta be careful though you don't get arrested yeah even that's play right <laughs> i was in a state once though of, of what you're talking about where it was very ecstatic oh my goodness it's five o'clock already um i'll just share this one thing the the expansiveness of what you're talking about i i love how uh how how true it is in you like i really feel i can i can hardly believe you're only 35 honestly but there's there's a way that i think your generation has benefited from all my generation did but there is definitely a resonance in you that is 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 very real and very tangible um i just want to share this experience cuz cuz you made me think of it when you were talking about being at play all the time so um, I had been in an expanded state for like five or six days. Interestingly, you talk about the yoga of ascension. Uh, one of my teachers is a man named Samuel Bonder and his, mm -hmm. his work was really about the yoga of descension. He called mm -hmm. it the waking down process. <laughs> and it, I, when I went through that, I, that was another one of the, you know, there were many, there been many awakenings over time. The near death experience was actually, there was one even before that. There was one before that, but it was nothing like as radical as the new death experience. But um, so I'd been with Samuel for three or four months and had what they call the second birth awakening, where I was mm -hmm. one with Mount Tam and everything and walking around. I was in this very accelerated state for days. And the carryover from my near death experience that I returned to again and again, and I think I mentioned this to you in our communication on the pod match. Um, I felt like I got initiated by the Pacific Ocean <laughs> rather than a guru or a lineage. Right. It was like the ocean, the universe was this ocean of love. Yeah. So after this awakening I had with Samuel, I was in that place where I was the ocean. And I was in downtown San Rafael and I was having too much fun. That's what made me think <laughs> about it when you're having fun all the time, no matter what's happening. And these police were like, what is she doing? Like she's dancing in the square in there's no music and she can't do that. And they came over to me and I fell to the ground and became the ocean. And three policemen could not get me up off the ground. They tried to lift me and I was, they were like, you should have seen them freak out. Yeah, it three was policemen like, can't lift the ocean, so. <laughs> I know, like, so there is a way that we're playing with realities here. Yeah. You know, and it's like little moments like that when you realize that what we think is solid and real, well, maybe you want to rethink that a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. So anyway. Yeah, and as you do your, you know, meditate, any sort of um, effective meditation practice, ultimately, you get to that point where you're just witnessing, where you're just bliss, mm -hmm. where you're just love. And you're just these qualities of awareness that are empty of thought and are empty of perceptual frameworks. 
And, and that's the, the fruit, I guess, of spiritual practice is becoming the ocean of love, becoming mm -hmm. God's infinite bliss and being able to just be. And uh, so maybe sometimes the policemen try to pick the ocean of love off the ground. But <laughs> good luck be, with that. You can be like Christ on the cross, you know, he <laughs> kept everybody in his heart, even as they were crucified. So, yeah. yeah. Well, Beautiful. I love where you're coming from. I'm so, so delighted to meet you and be able to have this level of a conversation. It's really, really a pleasure. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Well, let, let, tell me a little bit about your new book, since we, we've talked about a lot of different things. Uh, let's, yeah. let's talk about well, that new book. So it's, um, it was endorsed by five New York Times bestseller before it got published. Well, good. That's uh, great. Ariel Ford, uh, Gloria Steinem. Some people in mm. your age group don't even know who Gloria Steinem is. Which yeah, I know Gloria might, Steinem. A lot of people don't. It surprises me. Um, Errol Ford, mm -hmm. Gene Houston. Uh, anyway, it's the, the thing I love about it. I'm a fiction writer at heart. And writing biography is almost as fun as writing fiction. So it reads like a novel. And um, it's, I think it's going to have a big impact on the world the way Gene's book did. Yeah. because it's bringing her ideas back to life again, right. bringing them back into the public eye. So I have a website called junglegene.com. It couldn't mm -hmm. be easier to remember, much easier than trying to spell my name. There's also a gerilynjandro.com, but good luck spelling that one. <laughs> easier to go to junglegene.com. Especially the way I pronounce it. I know, I know. So junglegene.com, and you can actually download chapter one. Um, so I read chapter one. It's a really beautiful chapter that'll take you right into the rainforest, mm -hmm. you know, takes you right there on Jean's first expedition. So um, go ahead and grab that. People can go sign up, get, give me your email address. I'll keep, sure. keep you posted when things are going. Maybe you'll want to know when the autobiography Yogini gets released. Yeah. But it's a, it's a wonderful book. It's, you know, it just was released yesterday and it's an Amazon bestseller and I've already got like five star reviews and stuff. Cause it's a good, it's a wonderful book. I have yeah. to say the 20 years I wrote books for other people served this book very, very well. Mm -hmm. So it, would it be correct to say that, that Jean's initial book kind of laid out her theories, whereas this kind of lays out the journey? Well, I'll tell you, uh, Jean's book was difficult for some people to read. My, mm -hmm. uh, one of my siblings actually said, yeah, it's a difficult read, a challenging read, he said. Mm -hmm. and, and so he listened to me talk about it, but it, it's a treatise on human nature, really. Right. So it's very philosophical. She's old school, like people that write paragraph long sentences we don't do that anymore you know <laughs> people are used Lots to like semicolons <laughs> so it, it it is a dense read right whereas this is like reading a novel it right. it grabs you by the scruff of the neck and drags you mouth drags you right into the story so it's easier to read in that sense um and and it still lays out her theory mm -hmm. i think you know people would want to read both but this is probably going to be easier to read. They'll get the basic ideas and then they'll want to go read the continuum concept. It's, it, it, there's a beautiful pairing there. Um, and that's the way I designed it. Is, I mean, there are things, there are stories in here that are duplicated from what's in the continuum concept, but there's a lot of information in here and a lot of stories that have never before been published. So in some ways it's a primer, right? but it's the full, you know, it's like, the full meal at the same time it's right. a seven course meal i think i mean i know people are going to really enjoy it it's definitely it's my great. proudest achievement i poured my heart and soul into it so well i don't think there's anything more important that one can do right now if you have children than to raise them well yeah. and to yeah. so try to stop the cycle of trauma that mm -hmm. has been going on for a long time now yeah. And I think this is a way of doing that, of, of helping stop that, that wheel and cycle of trauma with us so that we don't pass it on to our children. So that our children come into this world knowing that they're loved, that they're supported, and that, so that they have that basic sense of safety, that they can go out into the world and be individuated and have a strong foundation. 
Yeah. And um, and I think I think that's what this talks about is how to help that, how to cure that, how to do that, how to ra to raise strong children who to become strong adults who are going to be facing an interesting world in the next 20, yeah, 30, 40 absolutely. years. It's going to absolutely. take it's going to take heroes and yes. heroes need loving mothers. Yeah. 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 All right. It's been a pleasure. I'll talk to you later. Until next time, everybody on Yoga of Ascension, be peaceful, loving, and fearless. I love you and have a good day.